All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Instrument Ground School. This is the prep, this is the class that prepares you for the Federal Aviation Administration Computer Test Examination for the Instrument Pilot, uh, Certified in Flight Instructor Instrument, and Multi-Engine Instrument. If you haven't already taken the written for that, but it's just a refresher for you guys. But basically, the Instrument Ground School. Is for the primary guys that are working on getting their instrument rating. Why should I get an instrument rating? A lot of reasons, but we'll just we'll just go over a couple. Um, this is a situation, and uh, you can go to Flight Chops on YouTube, and uh, the the guy was uh, just talking about. Basically, he was a pilot, and he was doing some airplane hopping. Uh, they were relocating airplanes and stuff, and. On the screen, this is what the day looked like. It looked like a pretty good day, you know. The weather looked good, lots of visibility, and everything was fine. But um, in the space of about 23 miles, which is not a very long flight, um, you can see there's the runway. He's on final right now, and he barely made it to final. But you can see uh, how the weather came in, and the visibility just went to crap. So this is definitely not a situation that you want to be in. And again, uh, just to, uh, I'm trying to get better at giving people credit for their videos. But you can go to YouTube, YouTube.com and plug in Flight Chops in the uh, search box. And the title of it is Why You Need an Instrument Rating. So I thought that was a pretty good uh, video. Another thing we need to uh, look at is why should I get an instrument rating? Uh... As far as fatal accidents, and this is like one of the top killers. This is one of the top killers of pilots. Uh, here, if uh, you, you probably know, but VFR, which is Visual Flight Rules, and to IMC, which is Instrument Meteorological Conditions. Um, we can see like the fatalities. I mean, this stuff is just, uh, whether it be it total or fatal, um, total accidents and in fatal I mean that's the highest in both areas in total accidents and in fatal accidents so um, you know um, you want to at least get some IFR training for certain type of survival technique if you do get yourself in the jam uh, a couple other areas aircraft owners save thousands of dollars in insurance costs uh, some airplanes can't even be purchased if you don't have an instrument rating um, you'll have more flying days and an increased safety buffer. Um, not to scare you, not to scare you, but you know, these things happen when you are not instrument rated and you fly out of visual meteorological conditions and instrument meteorological conditions and you haven't pr planned properly. Um, it just, it's a bad day uh, for that pilot, for this pilot. It's just bad. And this is one of the scariest things you never, ever want to see. You never ever want to just be buzzing around and all of a sudden you see mountain peaks. Uh, if you were instrument rated or trained in instruments, you would know that you should be at a minimum in root altitude that would give you uh, obstacle clearance <laughs> and radio signal reception. So, um, again, not to scare you, but just to emphasize. Um, if you don't have this, you'll eventually need it, but I'll be just kind of going over things and everything will be pretty much presented in the videos, but you should have a Jefferson commercial or instrument commercial manual, or you should at least have, at the very least, an instrument flying handbook. If you can't find them, uh, just email me and I will help you out. You should also have, not just, you should have the current year, but we're currently in 2015, a FAR AIM, which is the Federal Aviation Regulations and the Paranautical Information Manual. Uh, you need a knowledge test guide. It could be either GLIM or ASA. I prefer GLIM. Kind of like them both because GLIM just kind of puts the figures in a book and ASA actually gives you an extra book like you would have it in your test center. Um, you don't absolutely need these but you should have them. You should try to find and they could be expired. You should need some called US terminal procedures but in layman's terms or lay pilot terms we call these approach plates and you should find a low altitude and route chart so you could just look at the legend and stuff like that and get acquainted with um, the symbology and the terminology um, 
I don't, you don't need this. It's not essential, but I'm telling you, this will really, really uh, spike or enhance your uh, instrument training because I do a lot of videos and stuff like that using Microsoft Flight Simulator because when I was doing my instrument training, I always had Microsoft Flight Simulator. And it's so real because of different navigation aids, routes, and all that and everything. You can actually fly them on the simulator. So, if you have any problems obtaining these materials, um, just go ahead and uh, email me or give me a call. I'll be more than happy to assist you in uh, getting these items. So, at this point, you should be a private at the private pilot level or at least a pilot seeking recurrency for his or her instrument rating. Um, so you should have a working knowledge of, you know, when I talk about the basic six flight instruments or an airspeed indicator or altimeter. If you're not, just kind of bear with me. We'll, we'll get through it and stuff because anybody can watch the videos. I'm not restricting them. But as far as if you're going to take this seriously, you should be at the private pilot or instrument level or recurrency level. So here's our basic six flight instruments. We have our airspeed indicator. We have our attitude indicator, we have our altimeter, we have our vertical speed indicator, our heading indicator, and then turn coordinator. So at the private pilot level, we all know how these instruments work. But basically, at this point, um, we probably, and I remember when I started my instrument rating, I knew this stuff worked, but I didn't know how they worked. I wasn't very well versed in how they worked. So we have our vacuum driven instruments, which is our attitude indicator, heading indicator, and we'll have a suction gauge. Uh, to let us know that the vacuum system is operating properly. We have a pitot static system or pitot static instruments which is our airspeed indicator and hold on, did I just do something? Okay, I just want to make sure. Alright, so our pitot static instruments, our airspeed indicator, our altimeter, and our vertical speed indicator. And we have an electrically driven gyroscopic system. So this is a part of the gyroscopic system, but it's not vacuum driven like these two. It's electrically driven. And you can see DC meaning direct current electric. Uh, now another thing about this is you may not always have a, a turn coordinator. You may have a turn and slip indicator, but it's still going to be electrically operated. DC current electric, DC current electric. Um, back, so back to vacuum driven. How do these instruments work? Well, we have our attitude indicator, which we're going to talk about first, and our heading indicator, and our suction indicator, which is going to be calibrated in inches of mercury. Basically what happens is we have a pump, and this pump is actually going to suck air. Here's a filter, here's the air source, but it's going to suck air through the instrument, through the pump, and then dump it out overboard vent line. Again, we have a vented source, it's going to suck air through the instrument, and through this instrument as well. So all three of these instruments, air is being sucked through a vacuum air filter, through the instruments, here, here, here. Here's a vacuum release valve in case the pressure gets too big for the system or too much for the system or there's some blockage somewhere or buildup. It goes through the pump and then it dumped out an overboard vent line. Now while this happens, um, air is being spun or pulled past or fed into the instrument and it's helping rotate a gyro. All right, A gyro in this case is just it's a wheel with a heavily weighted rim. Okay, so as long as this thing is spinning, it's going to resist motion uh, two ways. Um, it's going to do it by through precession and uh, and gyroscopic uh, <laughs> rigidity in space. I don't know why I got that brain for <laughs> rigidity in space, and uh, is one of the principles. And then uh, we're going to talk about gyroscopic precession. But here's a little video on how the attitude indicator is used in flight. Mm, oh, okay, sorry. The attitude indicator shows an aircraft's position relative to the real horizon. The arc along the top, called the bank index, shows how far the wings are tilted. 
It has marks at 10, 20, 30, 60, and 90 degrees of bank. Lines above and below the horizon line show the pitch attitude of your airplane. Okay, so I thought that was pretty cool, but it shows you how it works. Now, we've already explained this system, how the pump pulls air through the instruments, air is vented through a vacuum air filter, pulled through the instruments, and then we get our indications. Rigidity, rigidity in space. Here's our gyro. So, I'm trying to come back to our wheel. Here's our gyro in the middle. Just think about that. This is a wheel with a heavily weighted rim. And... We're going to see how, even though the aircraft is mounted on these gimbals, right, the aircraft actually moves around a gyroscope, and the gyroscope stays in its plane of rotation. But here's a, just a little quick video. And I didn't want to go that far. Come on back. There we go. So we're going to see the, the gimbals move, but the gyro just stays where it's at just stays where it's at rotating in its plane so rigidity in space the gyro is resisting movement okay gyroscopic precession is another thing that we have to think about um, when an outside force is and this is the direction of rotation so then when we apply a force okay if we tilt here the force will be applied there and the force will actually respond as if it's been 90 degrees ahead in a, a plane of, ahead um, in, the, in the plane what we call a plane of rotation alright so even if although the force is uh, here it's gonna re react as if 90 degrees ahead I got a pretty cool video about this now normally when you when this man lets go of this wheel it should just drape down and he's going to demonstrate that but when he actually rotates it <clears throat> you're going to see something very different happen and he, uh, this, this is a YouTube video from veritasium.com uh, pretty cool video Okay, that was a pretty cool video. So the attitude indicator is the first um, instrument that we deal with, and the next one is our heading indicator. Uh, so our heading indicator again, vacuum, vacuum air filters where the air is pulled through through the instrument, through the pump into the overboard vent line. Um, here we have our gyro here it's bent and it's kind of vertically mounted but um, with precession what happens is 
this card is going to slide and what's going to happen is we're going to have to adjust it every couple minutes to the magnetic compass because this is not a north northern northerly seeking instrument uh, like a magnetic compass so it just has to be adjusted because the procession is going to make it the compass card slide here uh, we have our heading indicator adjustment knob and our magnetic compasses so just a reminder pitot static instruments consist of a airspeed indicator altimeter and vertical speed indicator okay we have a pitot tube here's our pitot tube up here and we have static ports our pitot tube feeds air directly into the airspeed indicator the pitot tube only affects the airspeed indicator the static port though if uh inputs static pressure so dynamic ram air pressure is provided to the airspeed indicator but static pressure is provided to the airspeed indicator vertical speed and altimeter now some airplanes have uh, most airplanes IFR should have a pitot heater switch and um, the drain opening and alternate static source uh, pitot static instruments again this is the airspeed indicator this is the altimeter vertical speed indicator now um, for our airspeed indicator ram air comes in goes through the pitot tube and it goes directly into a diaphragm this diaphragm expands and contracts the static line comes in and the static air is around here so the diaphragm is expanding and contracting against the static air ram air expands contracts against static air and then we have some gears there multiplying gears and we get an airspeed indication that's how our airspeed indicator works um, as far as the altimeter uh, we have a set of aneroid wafers and the static port feeds into the out, so outside of these wafers and these wafers are like an accordion they expand and they contract and, and that yields a uh, altimeter indication the vertical speed indicator is kind of like the same thing as the altimeter but it's a lot more sensitive um, the static source goes directly into the diaphragm so static pressure goes in here and then outside here there's a calibrated leak and that's how we get our trending information from the VSI types of airspeed indicated indicated is what you see directly on the instrument calibrated calibrated airspeed is airspeed corrected for installation and instrument errors uh, when you're in a climb the aircraft is not really directly facing the relative wind so you know there's a couple errors there equivalent airspeed calibrated airspeed corrected for adiabatic compressible flow at a particular altitude now at this stage of the game you're probably not going to be dealing with aircraft that move above 200 knots and above uh, altitudes of 20,000 feet so it really doesn't apply to you right now but all it's trying to get you to understand is that air is compressed in front of the aircraft as it passes through and the compressibility causes abnormally high airspeed indications so your equivalent airspeed is actually lower than our calibrated airspeed. Um, the air just kind of gets in the way. It doesn't want to move out, out of the way anymore. True airspeed is your actual um, airspeed as it moves through undisturbed, undisturbed air. Um, you can calculate your true airspeed um, from calibrated airspeed or equivalent airspeed using pressure and temperature using your flight computer. And there we have the E6B flight computer. Mock speed. Uh, at this stage of the game, just working on your instruments, you're probably not going to be working with aircraft that deal with Mach speed, but Mach speed is the ratio of the aircraft's true airspeed in relation to the speed of sound. And you would actually have a Mach meter on your panel, and they, these are three different Mach meters. Um, this is actually an airspeed indicator with a Mach meter built in. Uh, so. Those are the type of air speeds. Another thing that we need to be familiarized with are V speeds and the color codes in airspeed indicators. So we have our, our speed indications, we have our pointer, but we have some color coding going on in here. 
Uh, the bottom of the white arc, this is the white arc, and the white arc is normally the flap operating range, but the bottom of the white arc is stall speed in the landing configuration at maximum landing weight. Uh, bottom of the green arc is stall speed in a clean configuration, meaning flaps up, gear up. Um, right along. The white arc is the full flap operating range. I said that before. Top of the white arc is the maximum flap expended, extended speed, VFE, max flap extended. Green arc is the normal operating range. So this is the normal range that the airspeed should be at when you're flying this aircraft. Top of the green arc, maximum structural cruising speed. Uh, yellow arc is smooth air. You must be in smooth air. All right, when you're operating at speeds this high. And the red arc is a never exceed speed. You never ever want to go past the red arc in this aircraft. Altimeters. There's altimeters, there's three different types of altimeters. Uh, some specific characteristics of, of altimeters, no matter what type you have, you're gonna have an adjustment knob to adjust the setting in what we call a Colesman window Colesman window right there so uh, here's a Colesman window there there's a Colesman window there there's a Colesman window there um, these are all pretty much set for 29 or 9 or 2 uh, which is a barometric pressure setting again how the altimeter works we have a static port that feeds into the outside of some aneroid wafers and these aneroid wafers um, feel the pressure difference and they expand and they contract to give us a altimeter reading indicated altitude is the is what you see on the altitude on the face of the altimeter our altimeter right here is showing us 9,900 feet we're almost at 10,000 feet pressure altitude pressure altitude is whatever's displayed on it's your indicated altitude when the Colesman window is set till not two nine or nine or two. Um, it also shows you where you are above the standard datum plane, which is just uh, one of those things that engineers use. It's like this magical, magical, perfect atmosphere, which it's never perfect, but you know this is the standard datum plane where everything is standard. Um, standard temperature pressures, all this stuff and everything. Um, but one thing about our Colesman window, when we fly above flight level 180, 18,000 feet, we automatically set the Colesman window to 299 or 2. So everybody's on the same uh, plane or page. True altitude, actual height above uh, mean sea level. Here's our true altitude. It's our height above sea level, not necessarily the standard date on plane, but actually sea level. Absolute altitude, AGL. So when I think of absolute, I think of A, AGL above ground level. It's the actual height of an object above the Earth's surface. Now, there are what we, now, so everybody's on the same plane in engineering and performance and stuff like that and everything. Uh, we have international standard atmospheric values. Okay. And, hmm, it's very hard to see the sea level ones, but here, um, it would be 15, 15 degrees Celsius, uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 101.3 millibars, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Um, the atmosphere in mercury, the weight is 2992 inches of mercury, and we'll talk about that. Um, but there's, and there's values, and here I, again, I got. Um, at sea level standard atmospheric values are like I said 2992 inches of mercury um, now we'll talk about lapse rate because when as we climb every thousand feet we climb we would use we would lose about one inch of mercury for each thousand foot in altitude and standard lapse rate normal normal atmosphere standard lapse rate Every thousand feet, we would lose two degrees Celsius or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit in the normal atmosphere. But in the weather section, we'll go more in depth into that. 
vertical speed indicator how it works uh, and again this is a part of the pitot static system just like the airspeed indicator and altimeter it's connected through static port and an alternate static source okay there's a direct line to the static pressure so this is a direct line to the atmosphere and it is a diaphragm uh, that expands and contracts uh, well, kind of like an accordion thing but there's a calibrated leak that is constantly comparing the outside pressure to the direct static pressure um, so it's continuously trying to equalize so when it's pretty much equalized it will stay at zero and then if there's like a pressure change when you climb or descend it will show a it will show trend information through that calibrated leak it wouldn't just move all the way it is kind of just come up and sit if you're in a steady climb or a steady descent pitot tube blockage okay if your ports are iced over just like in this previous figure you can see that the port is iced over couple things <clears throat> if the pitot tube is blocked and the drain hole is open you will not get any ram air pressure so there's no there's ram air pressure there's no ram air pressure to compare with static pressure so it's going to drop to zero all right uh, now when the ram hair the ram air inlet is blocked and the drain hole is frozen over as well pressure is going to be trapped so it's going to just give you a continuous air wherever you froze or whatever so the speed was at the altitude you froze at that's pretty much where it's going to stay even if large power changes are made you're not going to see any difference um, you have to use caution because where you're going to see the difference is when you increase altitude and you're going to get some erroneous readings because normally when we climb airspeed bleeds off but it's going to show more airspeed and when you descend in this situation it's going to show less airspeed so you could be descending thinking man I'm losing airspeed and you could be flying yourself faster into the ground if you're not careful so that's why it's very important that you have a working knowledge so when the ram air is blocked only the airspeed indicator is going to be affected now when our static port is blocked all three of these pitot-static instruments are going to be affected because the static port supplies the altimeter, vertical speed, and airspeed indicator. So you want to be careful. All three of these instruments are going to be affected. All right. So if the static port becomes blocked, just the static port, the airspeed indicator will react to changes in airspeed. You're still going to get ram air, but you're going to get incorrect readings. And at altitudes above where the blockage occurred, um, the pressure will decrease and the airspeed indicator is going to read lower than normal. Uh, when flying at lower altitudes, higher than uh, normal airspeed will be indicated due to relatively low static pressure trapped in the system. But the greater the distance from where you iced over your static port, the greater error you're going to have in the instrument. Um, so, um, the altimeter is going to freeze. If the static port, the altimeter will freeze, and the VSI would just kind of it will move to zero because there's no trending information. Now, luckily for redundancy, we have pitot heat switches where we can warm this up, warm the front, warm the drain opening, <clears throat> and then we have alternate static air. Uh, if we do use the alternate alternate static air. Airspeed is going to be reading higher than normal. VSCI is going to show a momentary climb. Airspeed is going to read higher than normal. So, for redundancy. And we're about at the half hour mark. I try to keep these around 30 minutes. So, we're going to stop right there. There's going to be a continuation to this video. So, this is just module one. Um, I thank you for watching the video. Um, if it was informative or you got really good information from it, just stay tuned. And uh, please like and subscribe. If there's any comments, questions, or anything like that, please don't hesitate to let me know um, by email. And in the subject box, please put aviation. Um, I'd like to thank you for watching, and have a great day.